Imagine you have a folded up ball of string. On the string are some beads, but you want to know exactly what order the beads are placed on the string. But you can't just figure it out by looking at the folded ball. So first, you'd want to untangle and unfold the ball. And once it's unfolded, you want to specifically pick one end to start, since the order of beads you pull out will differ if you start on the other side. Then you'd pull off that first bead, write down what color it is, and one by one pull off each remaining bead and record the order that they come out. Now when biochemists want to figure out the primary sequence of amino acids in a protein, they follow a format very similar to what we did here. It's a procedure developed by Swedish biochemist Per Edmund, and in this video we're going to talk about that process called the Edmund degradation. Now to understand the basics of Edmund degradation, we first have to have some general background information. We won't go into specifics, but let's quickly review the structure of a single amino acid and peptide bond formation. We will then dive into the mechanism itself for Edmund degradation, and finally we'll talk about some benefits and some limitations. The amino acid in its simplest form has a nitrogen-carbon-carbon -carbon backbone. One end is the amino terminus, named for its amine group, the middle carbon is called the alpha carbon, and the other end is a C-terminus named for its carboxyl group. Coming off of the alpha carbon is a hydrogen and an R group. This R group represents one of 20 different amino acids coded for by mRNA and translated by the ribosome. Now the electronegativity difference from this carbonyl oxygen creates a dipole moment, and the partial positive nature of the carbonyl carbon on the C-terminus of the existing amino acid makes it susceptible to nucleophilic addition. This actually occurs by the lone pair on the amine group of the next approaching amino acid. Without going into specifics, the hydroxyl group from the C-terminus of the existing amino acid and the hydrogen from the incoming N-terminus are cleaved off and joined to form water, which makes peptide bond formation a condensation reaction. The overall result of the reaction? We get a single bond with double bond characteristics between the C-terminus of the previous amino acid and the N-terminus of the new amino acid. Now, Although formation of the peptide bond isn't the focus of this video, you'll see later on that familiarity with the peptide bond is integral to the understanding of Edmund degradation. Now thinking back to the beginning of this video, we saw that we couldn't figure out the single beaded sequence without first unfolding the ball. Likewise, in a protein, before figuring out the primary amino acid sequence, we must first unfold the protein out of its quaternary, tertiary, and secondary structure. To unfold the proteins, we use a technique called sodium dodecyl sulfate polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, or SDS page. The details of SDS page are covered in another video, but in short, SDS is a surfactant with a polar head group and nonpolar hydrocarbon chain. SDS disturbs hydrogen bonds, hydrophobic and ionic interactions between our groups that make up tertiary structure. Finally, heat is used to bind SDS to the protein and apply an overall net negative charge. This linearizes the molecule, much like we linearized our beaded ball of string. Now imagine our string is a polypeptide. Let's say one end of the string is the N-terminus, and let's zoom in on those first three amino acids and examine the mechanism behind the Edmund degradation. We're going to go over the reaction for Edmund degradation now. Obviously, any reaction begins with the important molecules of that reaction. In this case, we're going to use a simple polypeptide, a tripeptide here, um, in which we have three different amino acid residues. We're also going to go, and they're all labeled R1, R2, and R3. We're also going to go ahead and label the N-terminus as well as the C-terminus. And this will be important for the reaction because the function of Edmund degradation occurs at the N-terminal amino acid. So we want to make sure that we're aware of which end of the chain we're attacking in this situation. Um, the second important molecule involved in this is what we'll refer to as Edmund's reagent. And Edmund's reagent chemically is known as phenyl thioisocyanate, or again, Edmund's reagent. And now we're going to draw this and we're going to break it down for you. We're obviously going to start with the phenyl group here. And so we have this benzene ring. And then off of that, we're going to draw the cyanate character. Now, cyanate if you'll remember, is a double bonded carbon-nitrogen pairing. From there, we're going to talk about the thio character, which happens to be a double bonded sulfur-carbon pairing. And so again, you have the phenyl thio isocyanate molecule. 
And this molecule is important in this reaction because not only does it act as a label for this N-terminal amino acid, but it also works within the mechanism itself, creating intramolecular reaction to help the over or the eventual cleavage of the N-terminal amino acid. And the way it starts is it breaks the double bond between this carbon and nitrogen molecule or atoms here of phenothiol isocyanate or PTC even. It breaks the double bond between the carbon and nitrogen, and that carbon comes to bond with the nitrogen of the N-terminal amino acid. Okay? From there, obviously that forces that hydrogen to get kicked off. And because this N this nitrogen on the phenothiol or PTC molecule is has free electrons, it ends up binding with the hydrogen that is now free from the from the polypeptide chain. The intermediate that this reaction forms comes down here. The labeling of our N-terminal amino acid via Edmonds reagent uh, creates a, this intermediate that we refer to as a phenol thio carbamoyl derivative. And this will take reaction with the addition of now an acid. And we'll just use HA as a nondescript acid or some random acid. And what that does, this additional acid, is it affects the character in that it allows for the protonation of this first carbonyl oxygen and ultimately protonates it. Now, given that we have this protonated oxygen, we're going to use the character of, of the phenothiol isocyanate or the PTC that we, or Edmonds reagent that we have, and we're going to utilize the sulfur, cap as, um, the sulfur for its nucleophilic capabilities in this case. So you'll see as under acidic conditions, the sulfur will act as a nucleophile and attack this carbonyl oxygen, which will ultimately lead to the disruption of this pi bond and the production of this new intermediate down here, which happens to contain a five-membered ring. As you can see here, this new intermediate contains a five-membered ring in which the sulfur molecule or atom has the positive charge here, and you still have all amino acid residues intact. The next thing we're going to do in the, in the Edmonds degradation is we're going to use the conjugate base or the um, for the acid that we used up in the previous step. And we're going to use that as a way of breaking or rearranging the double bond character in our molecule. So to do that, we're going to attack, the base is going to take this hydrogen from the nitrogen in the five-membered ring, which will rearrange the pi bonds in the five-membered ring such that you create uh, rearranging of these double bond characters, taking it from the sulfur to the nitrogen, and ultimately creating this next molecule here. As you can see here, our molecule is now deprotonated. Our five-member ring no longer contains a sulfur that has the positive charge. Got to get rid of this. And, and so now the next step in the process is to create a better leaving group. Now you remember, we still have that conjugate base in our solution, and we'll, we'll denote it as B. Again, just some arbitrary arbitrary base that we're going to utilize, and again, it's conjugate to the acid that we used in, previous, in the prior steps. And what we're going to do now is we're going to reprotonate. Now, reprotonating, it allows us to create a better leaving group, but rather than reprotonating the oxygen that we protonated earlier, we're actually going to protonate this nitrogen. So this nitrogen from the second amino group is actually going to grab the hydrogen off of the base and that kicks off that sigma bond and that ultimately protonates the nitrogen here. Okay. Now what that does from there on is to create a better leaving group, we're going to actually redistribute the electrons wherein we're going to reproduce that that pi bond or the double bond from that carbonyl oxygen. And from there, we're going to 
bring electrons over to create this intermediate whereby the high oxygen is double bonded and has the hydrogen, so it's protonated. And so now we have this new intermediate that looks like this. And you have your plus we have the dipeptide. And again, we're using intramolecular, uh, or we're using the base that we have in our solution to now deprotonate that hydrogen, or that oxygen rather, taking that hydrogen, leading to the final products that we see down here. Now, the final product is a, again, we have the a new dipeptide, which can again be taken out of the solution and rerun through more Edmund degradation to produce the, the sequence that we're looking for. But then we also have this phenolthiodantoin molecule. So let's take one more look at this phenolthiohydantoin derivative. And as you can see highlighted here, this is a nitrogen carbon carbon backbone with an R group attached. This is the original N-terminus amino acid that we targeted and cleaved off in the beginning of the procedure. Once this is isolated, it can be identified using high-performance liquid chromatography, a technique covered also in a different video. But by using this technique, biochemists are able to identify the amino acid residue isolated, and by using a series of Edmund degradations, the primary amino acid sequence of a protein can then be determined. So what are the benefits of Edmonds degradation over other processes, such as Sanger degradation? Well, first off, we get a controlled stepwise cleavage of amino acid residues versus a full hydrolysis found in Sanger degradation. This allows for actual sequencing of amino acids rather than a simple identification of constituents. Additionally, due to the consistent binding of Edmonds reagent to the N-terminus of the amino acid, the process can be automated. Now all good things don't come without drawbacks. One of the limitations to Edmund degradation is that degradation is limited to peptides of up to 30 residues. Since chances are high that the sequence you're studying is longer than 30 residues, that sequence will first need to be cleaved before you can begin Edmund degradation. Another limiting factor is that many eukaryotic peptides often have an N-terminal block that prevents the binding of Edmonds reagent. And finally, there's the sheer fact that you have to isolate and purify one single protein so that you're not sequencing two different proteins at the same time. So in conclusion, let's summarize the steps that we've talked about. First, you want to linearize the protein into a single-stranded polypeptide using a technique such as SDS PAGE. Second, you want to treat with phenyl isothiocyanate under alkaline conditions. Third, you want to apply acidic conditions to cleave the amino acid from the rest of the polypeptide chain. And finally, you want to extract, isolate, and identify the amino acid using high-performance liquid chromatography. Thank you very much for watching this video. We hope you enjoyed it, and good luck in your continued studies.